Hi, my name is Ron Brinkman, and I'm going to be talking about visual effects cues and really about all the things that you need to look at when you are creating visual effects. Uh, a number of different programs in the series will talk about specific technical aspects of visual effects, different tools and things that can be used to, to create visual effects. But this is more of an overview of uh, how this needs to be looked at from an artistic point of view. What's some of the things that you're going to be looking at and, and visually need to keep in mind as you're creating visual effects. Visual effects is really about creating things that didn't exist in the real world using whatever tricks are available, physical or, or software or any number of different tools to create a visual effect. But the whole point of it is to make the person that's viewing the visual effects, the audience, believe that it is real. A trained visual effects artist is going to be able to look at a scene that uh, may have some problems and, and identify specifically why there's a problem. They may notice a discrepancy in the way the lighting is on certain elements in the scene or, or how the shadows are reacting or something like that. But uh, even somebody that's not trained in spotting these particular problems, uh, they can still look at a scene and somehow just feel like the scene isn't correct. As I mentioned, their subconscious is used to seeing what's real and uh, little warning signs are going to go up in the back of their mind if some of these uh, real physical visual cues are not present in the scene. So how can we get around this? Well, uh, the main thing you need to do is really study what happens in reality. And uh, we're not doing anything different here than any other artist in, in you know, all of history has done in terms of learning how the real world is, uh, is seen and sort of what visual things happen whenever you're looking at a scene. Um, the most important thing you can do is, is to study reality and depending on what, <clears throat> what particular type of thing you're trying to recreate, um, you need to study that. So, for instance, I was doing a show where I needed to create computer-generated water and for me that was a great excuse to go down to the beach and, and stare at the ocean for a while. Of course, it's probably not so easy to just pop down to the beach if you live in Kansas, but on the other hand, uh, it's not so easy for me to pop out to a cornfield if I'm trying to recreate one of those. Um, there's always resources for researching what a particular scene needs to look like. And um, more importantly, a lot of the things that we're going to be discussing here are going to be common in every single scene that you work with. Uh, not to say that this is going to be an easy process, and in fact, this is an extremely difficult process. Why is it difficult? It's uh, not just difficult in terms of getting it to look right, but um, also because the tools that we have still can't completely duplicate reality. But some of the things that are common to all visual effect shots, and in fact all artwork in general, um, are sort of the, the major features that you're going to have to look for whenever you're putting together a visual effects shot. We're going to talk about um, these different visual effects cues and break them down into three specific categories. First category is the lighting in the scene, and it's by far the most important and probably also the most difficult to identify exactly what's going on. But we'll go into a lot of detail about lighting. The second issue that we want to be looking for is related to the camera, the, the thing that's capturing the scene. There's a lot of artifacts that go along with the camera and we'll talk a little bit about what those are. And then the last thing we'll be looking for whenever we're examining a scene is sort of what's happening with uh, the distance and the depth relationships between the objects and in fact the size relationships between the different objects and how they all interrelate to give a sense of a 3D scene even though we're really just looking at a flat image uh, projected onto a screen or onto a TV screen. Incidentally, all these uh, things I'm talking about are pretty much apply to no matter what kind of visual effects you're doing. Um, you, know, you may be creating a CG element and putting it into a live action background and all of the rendering and lighting that you'll have to do on that CG element should be appropriate for the background. Or you may be shooting somebody in front of a blue screen and then planning to composite them into a different background. Uh, all the same rules apply. You want to have your foreground element be created with the appropriate lighting and then when it's integrated into a different background scene you want to make sure that all of the various lighting cues match up and, and are appropriate for that scene. Uh, this may seem like common sense. It should be obvious that, of course, you want the lighting to match. But uh, when it comes down to the real world and, and trying to do this in practice, it's not at all that easy. Uh, it's hard to determine exactly what kind of lights are in the original scene and then getting them to match in a fashion that it is appropriate when you're using completely different tools for lighting uh, can sometimes be extremely difficult. <laughs> CG tools don't mimic real lights uh, completely. There's a lot of things that we'll see are, are quite a bit different about them. And even when you're shooting something in front of a blue screen, the lighting setup that you're going to have is not going to be the same as the lights uh, were in the, in the background that you're planning on putting that into. 
So there's four primary things we want to notice about a light or about all of the lights in our scene. The first thing we want to notice is their location. Where are these lights coming from? And there can be a lot of different lights in the scene, so this is easier said than done, certainly. The next thing you want to notice is the intensity of the lights in the scene, just how bright they are and how bright they are relative to each other. You want to notice the color of the lights in the scene. If you've got a variety of different light sources that have different color characteristics, you're going to want to take note of those and try to duplicate that. You want to notice the quality of the lights, and this is sort of a nebulous term, but it has to do with how diffuse the lights is, and whether it's a very hard light source, direct light source, or if it's a softer, uh, more ambient type of light source. And finally, you're going to be looking at interactive lighting. When you've got a light source in a scene, this light is going to affect the other objects in the scene. Let's look at each one of these things in a little bit more detail. So in an ideal world, you're working in a scenario where you're, you're shooting a background plate, you're on the set, and you can walk around and figure out exactly where every single light in the scene is, what kind of light they're using, if they've got big spotlights in one corner or softer lights in another area of the stage. You can write down exactly what they're doing with any kind of colored lights they're using and really get a completely accurate picture of what this scene is, this background scene is, so then when it comes time to create the foreground element, you know exactly what you need to know. Uh, that's the ideal world, and unfortunately we don't usually live in the ideal world. more common scenario that happens to most compositors is somebody hands them an image and tells them they need to put something new into this scene, and there's virtually no information about what happened uh, with the original background plate. There's no information about where the lights were and, and how things were set up. Uh, and in that case, what you're going to have to do is look at the scene and figure it out yourself. So the first thing to notice is, of course, where the lights are coming from. If you're looking at this scene, you can see we've got a really strong light coming from this corner here. But we can switch that around. You can get a good idea for what the different uh, light directions can do to the scene. Uh, another thing to notice that will help you determine where the light source is at is the shadow. Uh, you'll see right here there's a strong shadow being cast in this direction. And uh, that's obviously a pretty strong clue that there's a light coming from over here. Uh, of course, in the real world, you'll probably have a scene where there may be more than one shadow cast, uh, cluing you in that there are multiple lights, but it may be hard to determine which light is causing which shadow. Or your shadows may be a little bit softer and less well-defined, which is a clue to the quality of the light. The next thing to look at is uh, the, uh, the intensity of the light in the scene, how bright the different lights are. Again, if you weren't on the stage when the background was shot, you're not going to have a real metered reading of exactly how bright the light sources were. But at some point, that doesn't really matter because um, it re what really matters is what's, what kind of image has ended up uh, in, in the image itself uh, and what's going to be on the screen. And uh, so the main thing you need to look at is sort of the relative intensity of the lights in the scene. Uh, is the light on the left twice as bright as the light on the right, and that kind of thing. So if you keep track of this, it'll help you to understand, uh, at least relative to each other, what the intensity of the different light sources were. The, uh, the shadows in the scene can, again, also be a clue for the uh, intensity of the light as well, and, and how deep certain shadows are. And in fact, uh, if the shadows are, are very deep, you know that there's not much in the way of a fill light on the other side of the object, uh, but if they're not deep shadows, if they're barely noticeable, then you've got a fairly even illumination coming from around the scene. The next thing we want to look at is the colors of the light source and uh, how those relate to the object itself. In this particular situation, it's pretty easy to determine colors because the object is a neutral color. It doesn't have any color of its own. And so you can quickly look and see that we've got certain obvious colored lights striking this object. The real world, again, isn't usually that forgiving. And what we'll have is a colored object that may have a variety of different colors on the object. And you'll have to figure out what that object looks like without colored light sources to know what effect the colored lights are having on it. Again, look around the scene. There may be you know, more than one object in the scene. Sometimes you'll have uh, something that is more neutral, and that'll help clue you in for what sort of colored lights are showing up in the scene. The next thing you want to look at with your light sources is, is a, kind of a more esoteric concept, which is what's the quality of the light in the scene? And this one's almost impossible to define exactly, but uh, it really has to do mostly with whether it's a hard light or a soft light. A very sharp point light source will, will be a, uh, 
considered a hard light. And uh, one thing that can really help you determine this is by looking at the shadows. So a hard light source is going to give you very well-defined shadows and also very well-defined edges uh, uh, along the shape of the object. Sunlight on a very bright day, for instance, is going to be an extremely hard point light source. Um, it's not going to spread at all. It's not going to see very much diffusion at all. Whereas the opposite of that is something that is a broad expanse of softer light. On a, on a stage, something with a big diffusion screen or outdoors, a situation where you've got a very cloudy overcast day and there's not a noticeable light source, but on a really cloudy day, it's the entire sky is casting light onto the scene. And in fact, you'll notice that on a very overcast day, you see virtually no shadows in a scene. Um, and then, of course, you can duplicate something similar like that on a stage with soft lights and bounce cards and that kind of thing. The other thing to remember is that when you're putting an object into the scene, certain objects will cast lights themselves. Um, a most obvious and extreme example would be when you're putting an explosion into a scene. This is a very, very common visual effect trick. Uh, somebody didn't feel like setting off a stick of dynamite next to a high paid actor, and so they tend to put the explosion in after the fact. But uh, you have to make sure when you're putting this explosion into the scene that it's doing more than just being an explosion that's pasted on. Uh, when you've got a light source in the scene or something like an explosion that gives off a lot of light, it has to affect the other objects in the scene. And this is usually referred to as interactive lighting. And uh, if we take a look at an example of that here with just a flash going off, you can really see what's happened to the, uh, the scene and how this, this light is affecting a lot of stuff explosions and candles and fires and even fireplaces, all of these things are going to give off interactive light and they're going to affect the other objects in the scene. Even if the object uh, that you're putting into the scene isn't uh, a light source in and of itself, you need to be aware that other objects in the scene will still affect the lights and uh, will reflect light off of themselves and onto the scene. So again, to, to use a, a nice obvious example, if you bring this large red object into the scene and hold it up next to our statue, we can see that next to something with a lot of color, you're going to want to affect the, your new object to show some of this reflected light. Or by the same token, if you're put some, putting something into the scene that has a lot of color, you may want to add some additional bounce color coming off of that onto the other objects in the scene. Once you get all the lighting cues figured out and you know what's happening with the lighting in the scene, there's still a little bit more that you need to think about in order to understand what's going on in there. And the main reason for that is because you're not really looking at the real scene. What you're going to be creating is something that was theoretically uh, seen through a camera instead. And that camera isn't just a transparent link in the process. The camera itself will introduce some artifacts into the scene that you're going to want to try and duplicate. And uh, depending on the camera, you're going to have different kinds of artifacts. Film cameras will introduce one sort of thing, and video cameras might do something slightly different. <laughs> We want to take a look at several of these different artifacts of the camera, and in fact, artifacts of the camera and even the film in some situations. Things like focus issues, uh, motion blur, lens flares, film grain. Uh, there's a variety of other ones. We'll kind of look at them uh, as we go through. The important thing to realize is that we're not uh, necessarily trying to completely duplicate the real world. What we're kind of trying to do is, is sort of seeing in the way that the camera sees and duplicating what the camera's eye saw on the scene. So let's look at each one of these things in, in more specific detail and talk about them one at a time. First of all, focus. Now, in the real world, focus kind of happens for you automatically. If you're looking out at the horizon, um, everything may not be in focus, but everywhere you're looking is in focus. And you don't consciously think about pieces of your view being out of focus. Um, your eye quickly adjusts no matter where you look and brings everything into focus. But when you're shooting a piece of film or video, uh, the camera lens doesn't know exactly where your eye is going to be looking on that big screen. And so there are certain places that are going to be in focus and, and very often certain places that won't be. The camera is only capable of focusing at a certain fixed depth. 
and everything else that's not at that depth will be out of focus, uh, either slightly or by a greater amount. So focus is a pretty simple concept to understand, at least in theory, and we're all pretty familiar with it. Um, it's also a real easy thing to do with a camera. Uh, we go ahead and take the scene and, and put it out of focus, for instance. But there's something that uh, should be brought up here, is that even though it looks like the scene got very blurry, um, a number of the tools that we have for doing digital blurs are not necessarily the same thing as a real defocus. Let's take a look at another scene here and discuss what's happening with the focus in it. So if we look at these different lights in the scene and then we go ahead and throw the camera out of focus, you'll notice that um, there's something more than just a simple blur going on here. The, the light sources don't just turn blurry, but they actually grow into what's known as a circle of confusion. It's really sort of a lens flare artifact, something that appears on the screen and still has distinct edges. It hasn't gone all soft and fuzzy. And depending on what kind of software you're using to generate defocused elements, uh, you may or may not be able to get this exact effect. But be aware of it and understand that uh, it's not a particularly simple thing to always duplicate this kind of an artifact. On the other hand, a lot of times you can just use a blur and get away with it. And you're really going to have to look at the scene in question and decide what you can get away with and what it's going to need to have uh, some special care taken to produce a really good defocused effect. There's another kind of blur that we want to talk about, as long as we're on the subject of focus and blur. And that would be motion blur. This is an artifact of an object moving as the, the camera is filming it. It occurs whether you're working with film or video. And uh, it's sort of a, the streaking effect that you get as an object quickly moves across screen. So if we look at this scene here where we toss a ball into the air, you can see that uh, you have a noticeable motion blur on it. If we're shooting this on film, a film camera typically runs at 24 frames a second, which means that um, each frame, each image that's captured, is capturing 1 24th of a second's worth of, of action, of motion. Uh, inside of the film camera, there's actually a little shutter that's rotating around and controlling how much of the individual film frame is being exposed every time it captures a frame. And that usually runs at about uh, half the speed of what is being captured for every frame. It's called a 180 degree shutter if it's running at a normal situation. And that just means that for every frame that goes through, half of the time it's going to be exposed to light and the other half it won't be. So what that means, if you think about it, is that uh, for every 1 24th of a second that uh, the frame is, is sitting behind the lens, half of that time is actually being exposed to the subject, meaning that 1 48th of a second is about how long it's being exposed. Uh, don't worry too much about the numbers, but the bottom line is you've got this short period of time where the lens is being exposed to the light, and when you get an object moving across frame, however long or how far it moves during the time that the film's being exposed, that's going to be the length of the blur that you see. If I've got a ball that starts here and moves this distance over the course of a single frame's exposure, you're going to get a, a blur that is about this long. If we take a look at this image again that has the captured motion blur in there, you can see that the motion blur is symmetric. You don't have a leading edge and a trailing edge or anything like that. It's just an artifact of the camera and the film having been exposed for a certain length of time and then stopped being exposed, and so you won't see a leading edge on that. That type of an artifact is uh, really only seen when you're working with flash photography or some kind of strobe where um, the light can, can die out over a period of time or take a second to reach full intensity. Uh, the other place where you tend to see motion blur with a strong leading edge and then a trailing blur is, is in most uh, cartoons. So if you put an object into a scene and that object is moving, um, but it wasn't moving originally when you photographed it, you're going to need to create some kind of motion blur. Um, you'll need more motion blur if the object's moving more quickly, of course. And the tools that you can use to create this motion blur will depend on the software that you're using or what kind of tools you have available. But if you don't create motion blur, if you put a fast-moving object into a scene and it doesn't blur, what you're going to see is something that looks very artificial. It's going to be very stroby, not at all smooth, and it'll stand out as being an artificial element that was placed into the scene um, not when the original photography was done. <laughs> Incidentally, video cameras behave similarly to film cameras in the sense that they will, will capture a, a certain moment in time um, they don't have a mechanical shutter in there that's determining what the length of the exposure is, but there is an electronic equivalent uh, 
that lets you control how what uh, what segment of time is captured, how fast the the shutter is going when it captures a single frame. The video camera will still be running at 30 frames a second if you're working in NTSC video, but within that 30th of a second, there's an even smaller window where it will actually capture the image. Uh, on a lot of video cameras, you can take that speed up to one one thousandth of a second, which allows you to freeze very quick motion and still see a lot of detail in it. Again, if you were to play this back, it might look terribly natural. It'll look uh, very jerky and artificial, but if you, what you're trying to do is capture a very clear image or freeze a moment in time, then that's when you want to use that kind of uh, technique. Another camera artifact that we want to discuss is the lens flare. This is what happens when a light source is shined almost directly into the camera lens. And uh, a good example of that can be done very simply just using a flashlight. You can see there's a noticeable flare that comes off of the light source itself. And as I move the light around, you can also see there's a bunch of secondary artifacts that show up as well. These are a result of the light that's being shined into the lens bouncing around within the lens assembly. And you're getting a number of intermediate reflections that happen. A lot of times they'll take on a particular orientation. You'll see some sort of a horizontal line that uh, has the different lens artifacts radiating outward from it. Another important thing to notice about a lens flare is what happens whenever it's partially occluded. So if we move something in front of this flare or in front of this light source, you can see that the lens flare isn't just completely covered up, but rather it kind of bleeds through and around the edges and you get an even different kind of characteristic. Overall, the flare appears to be dimming and growing brighter as opposed to just having pieces of it cut out by the element that's obscuring it. A couple more things to mention about lens flares. First of all, they are very specific to the camera that's being used. Um, different lens assemblies will cause quite a bit of a difference in terms of the type of lens flares that you see. Uh, the camera aperture will control, in some, in some instances, sort of the shape of the lens flares and the little elements that are kind of split off from the center of the flare. And in fact, uh, certain types of camera lenses will produce dramatically different lens flares. Here's an example of uh, a lens flare that was shot with a special anamorphic lens. This is a, a lens that's used for widescreen photography and for projection of widescreen films. And you can see there's a very noticeable horizontal lens flare that's introduced to this, this large blue bar that goes all the way across the screen. That's very characteristic of anamorphic lenses. And so if you're working on a film show where the uh, entire film was shot with an anamorphic lens, you want to make sure that the lens flares that you're putting into the scene, if in fact you're introducing artificial lens flares, you want to make sure that they match the type of camera and the type of lens that was used to shoot the scene. Lens flares have been used a lot, and uh, they seem to be used more and more with a lot of computer-generated imagery used probably too much, in fact. Um, a few years ago, it seemed like all of a sudden all of the software packages for doing rendering in included some tools for adding lens flares, and all of a sudden you saw them everywhere in TV commercials, and everybody that was doing CG stuff was putting lens flares into the scene to the point where it was too much. The other disadvantage or the other problem with a lot of these artificial lens flares is they just don't look quite right because they're too perfect. All the lens assemblies are uh, perfectly lined up, and you don't see any of the spurious artifacts that happen in a real lens flare. You don't see some of the chroma shifting and that sort of thing. So if you're going to use a lens flare, first of all, make sure it looks real, make sure it looks good, make sure it fits in the scene and fits with the camera that's being used, and then just don't overdo it. Only use it where it's appropriate to help make sure that the scene feels real. Only do it when there would be a motivation, which would be a strong enough light source that's pointed more or less directly at camera that would cause a lens to flare in the real world. Another artifact that you probably have to deal with when you're doing visual effects work, particularly if you're working in film, is film grain. And the grain that is inherent in a piece of film whenever you shoot footage on it. Different types of film are going to have different grain characteristics, but there's a few rules of thumb that you can keep in mind. Um, slower film, film that uh, requires more light to expose the image is going to tend to be less grainy, uh, cleaner, in fact. Whereas faster film, which is usually what you're using if you're shooting in lower light conditions, is going to have more grain, and you'll see a noticeable increase in the grain in the image. We can take a look at an example of this. Here's a couple of different types of film stock, different speeds of film, running side by side. And you can see 
a, a big difference in the grain characteristics between the two of them. You need to be aware of the grain in a film image because it's really important to, to use as a tool to match new elements into the scene. Um, if you shoot your original background plate with a particular type of film, it's going to have a certain grain characteristic. And anything new you're going to add into that scene, you're going to want to have the same sort of a grain characteristic. It may seem like a very subtle thing, and in fact it is very subtle, but um, it was certainly one of the most common problems with adding CG imagery into live action scenes in the past, where initially you'd render something in CG, it has no grain whatsoever. It's a very clean image. And unless you do something to slightly degrade the image to add some of this grain into it, the CG stuff will stand out as being too clean and too perfect. So that's a very common situation that you need to deal with that. But even if you're shooting two different things on film, if you're shooting something in front of a blue screen and then plan to put that into the scene, you've got to be aware that the footage of the person shot in front of blue screen is going to have a certain grain characteristic. And as that's placed into a different background scene, you want to keep an eye on making sure those things match. This is not as easy as it sounds. Even if you're shooting on the same type of film, the same film stock, um, there are other variables that can, that can cause this to be a problem. Uh, the way a piece of film is exposed, and in fact the way it's developed, can affect the grain pattern and, and the amount of grain that you perceive in there. Even if you get all of those things together, certain things that we do digitally when we composite scenes together can affect grain. So if you're working with blue screen, you may be doing some additional um, color corrections that might bring up the grain or bring out the grain. Um, different records of the film or different channels in the digital image will show different amounts of grain. Blue is typically a grainier record than red or green. And so sometimes if you're doing something where you tend to use more of the blue record, you'll see more grain introduced into the scene, and you have to compensate for that. The other thing that can happen to affect grain is certain digital processes like blurring. If you blur an image to simulate a defocus, you're going to take all of the grain out of it. That's one of the first things that goes. And um, if you're trying to, trying to simulate a defocus, you know, if you take a real camera and you throw it out of focus, you're still going to have grain on that scene. The grain is not affected because it's an artifact of the film itself, not of the lens or any of, any of the other photography process. So if you want to simulate a defocus by using a blur or even any other kind of defocus tool, you need to make sure that you add grain back into the scene once you're done to preserve the original grain or to duplicate something that at least looks reasonable and looks like it still has grain in it. By the way, even though when you're shooting on video you don't have film and consequently you don't have film grain, there is a similar issue, issue that uh, comes up in the fact that uh, a certain amount of noise can be introduced depending on how the camera is set up. So if we take a second and readjust our camera to shoot for a slightly different situation, what you'll see is an increase in the amount of noise in the scene. What we've done is we've actually dimmed the lights in the scene or dimmed the amount of light that's coming into the camera and then turned up what's known as the gain within the camera. It's an electronic trick where it tries to gather more light um, from within the scene, but it's the same problem we have with different film stocks. To, to, use, to use less light, it needs to uh, accentuate stuff and you end up with more grain in the scene. The last major category that we want to talk about for visual, visual cues and visual effects cues has to do with distance and perspective effects that are partly dealing with what you have in the camera, but more dealing with really uh, the real world and, and how distance is perceived, and specifically how whenever you capture an image, a real world image, there's this translation step between the 3D world and the 2D image that's being captured. And these are sort of different depth cues, things that give you a clue as to how large an object is in the scene and how far away it is from the camera. Um, these are all important, as was the last thing we talked about, because again, you have to keep them in mind when you're putting a new object into the scene. So if you're shooting something on blue screen, or if you're rendering a 3D element, uh, if you don't have an appropriate match for the camera and for the placement of the camera and for the lens on the camera, the object won't look correct. It won't look like, like it really fits into the scene. It's a very subtle problem sometimes because if you take an object that was shot with a wide-angle lens and put it into a scene that was shot with a telephoto lens, um, it's hard to say that why it doesn't fit into the scene, but the perspective will be slightly off, not noticeably in a lot of situations.
but again, the sort of subconscious expert that you've got in the back of your mind is going to notice this and feel that there's something wrong. Depth cues are the same issue, where you need to make sure that what you're doing when you put an object into the scene is keeping track of what sort of clues the eye is going to expect to see to determine the, the size and the distance of the object you're putting into the scene. So the first thing to talk about is the sense of perspective that happens and how that can be affected by how you're filming it. Let's take a look at an image here, which is just a, a row of candles that was shot from uh, fairly close up with a wide angle lens. And you can see that there's a noticeable perspective shift, that the object in the distance get significantly smaller as they recede. Uh, the far candles are only about three or four feet away from the near candles, but you can see there's a noticeable change in the perspective on them. Compare that to the second image here, which was shot with um, a much longer lens, instead of a wide angle lens, more of a telephoto lens, and shot from a much greater distance. Suddenly the perspective is not nearly as noticeable. In fact, the candles all appear to be about the same height, and they seem much more bunched up and much closer together. Nothing has changed in the scene. We didn't change the scene at all. What we did was change where the camera was located. And in fact, this, this artifact or this difference in perspective has everything to do with the position of the camera when it was shooting it. It's a common fallacy or a common misperception that the lens that's being used will introduce these perspective shifts. And that's not really the case. But what happens is, as we move the camera farther away from the scene, what we did was put on a telephoto lens, a lens that magnified the scene, to make it so that it was approximately the same size and frame. So we did shift lenses, but that wasn't what caused the perspective change. If we look at the same scene from the far distance, but leave the old lens on it, leave the wide angle lens on it, we can see in this third image that the perspective still feels the same. The candles are, um, have the same relationship to each other visually. They don't appear to have that great depth that they had in the first shot. They're just smaller in frame. So again, the lens isn't really what's causing the perspective to change. It's the distance of the camera to the subject. Let's take a look at a real simple scene here to just help us discuss some of the uh, depth cues that we're going to be looking at. We've got a couple of balls in the scene. And the first thing we want to talk about, the, probably the most obvious depth cue uh, that you can have, is the one that lets you know what's in front of something else. So as we move the first ball in front of the, uh, in front of the second ball, there's an obvious overlap. And the mind, of course, realizes that the object that's in front of the other object is closer to you. And that one, like I said, should be obvious. But of course, in a lot of situations, you don't necessarily have that very convenient overlap to help you place an object in the scene. And that's really what we're interested in doing here, is, is placing an object in the scene, using as many cues as we can to help the viewer understand how far away this object is. Relative size, for instance, is something that we use to figure out how big something is and how far away it is. Notice I say relative size. It's the size difference between the objects in the scene. If we look at these two balls here, visually, if you go to measure them on your TV screen, you'll see that they are about the same size. However, they're not the same size ball at all. One is just a lot closer to the screen. In fact, the smaller one is closer to the screen. And visually, they appear to be the same size. But there's a number of other clues that are going to help us realize that they're not the same size and that, in fact, the one in the distance is slightly larger. One clue that we have about the size of these balls and the fact that they are a different size uh, is something that's known as depth of field. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, a camera can only focus at one specific distance. Uh, and then, of course, there's really a range that that focus can be held at. But the range is usually not infinite, depending on your situation. And so if certain things are in focus and other things are out of focus, uh, you can immediately decide that the things that are out of focus are not at the same distance as the things that are in focus. So in the situation here with our two different balls, uh, when the front ball is in focus, the back ball is slightly out of focus. Even though they may appear to be the same size on the screen, we know that the distance is different. And in fact, the one in the distance um, being out of focus must be farther away. So that's another clue that you need to use for determining distance and then also another thing that the audience will use to judge whether or not the size is different between the two balls. Here's another quick example of what we're talking about when we say depth of field. Take a look at the string of lights and as we shoot the camera down their length, you'll see that only certain ones are in focus. 
and there's a certain focus point, a certain focus distance, and everything that is away from that focus distance starts to get out of focus. Um, that happens whether it's coming towards you or away from you. So you can see the lights that are very close to the camera go out of focus, and then the lights that are very far away from the camera also uh, go out of focus. Focus distance and, and this depth of field is something that's determined by the aperture of the camera and the lens that's being used, and then the, the focus distance, uh, how far away from the camera are you focusing. And by the way, the, the two main camera settings that affect depth of field uh, are the lens and the aperture. So if you've got a longer lens, you're going to tend to have a, uh, a narrow depth of field. And if you're going to have a larger aperture, you will have a narrower depth of field as well. A smaller aperture will give you a much deeper or greater depth of field. The other thing that sort of affects the, uh, the size of your depth of field is just your focus distance. So as you focus farther away, the amount of focus area grows. The, the uh, distance that's in focus grows the farther away you focus. Another thing that can affect depth of field, or that will affect depth of field, is actually the format that you're shooting in. Different film formats or different sizes of films have different depth of field characteristics. Uh, smaller film formats, like 16 millimeter, will actually be able to carry a greater depth of field for a given lens and aperture setting. Uh, and as you move it to larger film formats, like uh, VistaVision, for instance, or other special large format films, such as IMAX, um, you can often lose your depth of field, and it's much harder to hold a deep depth of field. Um, all of these things aren't necessarily something that you should approach by trying to determine the numerical value of your depth of field for a given situation. It's more a matter of knowing the different situations that will affect depth of field and trying to replicate those in a way that's visually accurate whenever you're putting together your visual effects shot. Another clue about distance and, and uh, size of objects is the atmosphere in the scene. Um, a really obvious case is if you've got heavy fog or, or heavy smoke in a scene, and uh, things in the distance obviously fade away into the fog, into the smoke, or into the atmosphere. Um, things that are close up, are it's easier to see them. They're not obscured by the atmosphere. This is true even if you've got something that's a lot, uh, a lot more subtle than smoke or fog. Even on a reasonably clear day, if you're shooting outdoors, objects that are in the distance will take on a characteristic color um, of the atmosphere around them. They usually take on a bluish tinge as it goes into the distance. And in fact, that's usually most noticeable in the darks of the image. So if you're putting something into a scene, and even if you shot it you know, very close up and in a nice clean uh, stage or something like that, when you paste it into this background scene, if you want it to be far away, you're going to have to color correct it to make it appear as if there's some atmosphere on top of it. You'll probably bring the blacks up and maybe tint them towards blue. And that'll give you the sense that it's really in the scene and also uh, far enough in the distance. Here's a scene with a bunch of different objects in it, just a, a CG scene. And uh, the objects are different sizes and at different distances from the camera or from the observer. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce some artificial atmosphere into the scene. And we'll just play with this. We'll just turn it up and down a little bit. You can kind of see the effect on the objects in the scene and what happens to them and how the objects in the distance are really obscured as the atmosphere increases in density. The final depth and distance cue that I want to talk about is motion parallax. And unlike all of the other things we've been talking about where you could generally illustrate it as a, in a still frame or on a single frame example, motion parallax literally has to do with what happens to the perspective of an object and, and the movement of an object as it's at different distances from camera. And uh, this is really just a matter of how far an object moves compared to how close it is to the camera. So if we look at this scene here, we look at the ball in the scene, and we move the ball um, one foot from left to right, and fairly close to the camera, we can see that it runs almost completely across frame. But if we take the same ball and move it quite a bit farther away from the camera and roll it that same one foot distance, you're going to notice that it doesn't appear to move nearly as far in terms of how far across the frame it moves. Where this is important and where you're going to have to deal with this is not so much in 3D. If you've got a package that's rendering a scene, this is all going to happen automatically for you. Um, objects in, in the distance will appear to move uh, a smaller amount if they're farther away from camera. But if you're working in a composited scene and you're doing 
all of the movement yourself, you'll need to take this into account and understand that distant, distant objects are going to appear to move less, even if they're moving the same amount uh, in theoretical space. Okay, so that kind of gives you an overview of some real basic concepts for visual effects cues, and, and in fact, the cues that are used to help you determine what's happening in a scene and what the real world was doing whenever the scene was photographed. These cues are not at all specific to visual effects work. They're the same things that you would learn about were you to uh, pick up a good book on photography or even learn how to, uh, how to paint and take a painting class. These are, these are just artistic tools and artistic cues that are used to help identify things in a scene and to determine what's going on. Uh, everything we talked about was sort of in the context of placing an object into a specific scene, but you also need to be aware that when you're doing visual effects shots, they need to live in a larger context as well. They need to live within a bunch of other shots, some of which may not, may not be visual effects shots and some of which are. So whenever you're creating a visual effects shot, make sure you look at the scenes around it. Make, make sure you look at the whole sequence of images and make sure that you haven't done something that's not appropriate. Um, it used to be if you look at old films with visual effects in it, there were often big giveaways that a visual effects shot was suddenly happening. The, uh, the color of the scene would be off because it had gone through some sort of different optical process or all of a sudden the grain in the scene would increase dramatically. These days it's, it's less of a concern, but you still need to be very careful and not introduce something that, even if it looks okay in the scene in question, uh, won't cut with the rest of the scenes in the sequence. So hopefully that's given you a good overview. There's uh, a number of other programs in this, uh, in this course that will talk about a bunch of different aspects of visual effects, but make sure you keep all of these things that we've talked about in mind and use them as tools to help you integrate um, all of your visual effects work and make it consistent. Thanks.